usual warm welcome. And I've been asked to speak uh, during this particular uh, course of lectures on the Epistle of Paul to the Philippians, and I'm very happy indeed to do so. It's one of my own uh, favourite uh, portions of the New Testament. It is, of course, also uh, a part of the Word of God, uh, given by inspiration of God, and uh, in its uh, every single affirmation, it is therefore the Word of God. It is God's Word in its entirety. It is also, however, of course, God's Word given through human instrumentality. It's God's Word given uh, through his servant Paul. And it reflects, uh, therefore, uh, the techniques and composition of this man Paul. It reflects also uh, Paul's uh, background, his experience, his character, uh, and so on. Because inspiration, inspiration uh, does not uh, dispense with or override personality. Uh, it actually uses uh, human personality. So this is God's word given to us through his servant Paul. And I want to spend uh, just uh, a very few moments uh, setting this epistle in its uh, human uh, context. There is, as you know, uh, a corpus uh, of what are called uh, the Pauline epistles, uh, quite a body of those epistles, and uh, they are grouped normally uh, in uh, various uh, uh, collections. Uh, first of all, there are the two uh, to the Thessalonians, uh, uh, Thessalonians 1 and 2. Uh, these may be the earliest of Paul's epistles, written perhaps uh, around 51 uh, AD. And uh, they're concerned very much, as you recall, uh, with uh, the second coming uh, of the Lord Jesus. Uh, but they're remarkable too because they contain, even at that very early stage, uh, a very complete Christology, uh, a very full grasp uh, of the deity uh, of uh, the Son of God. There is no sign at all that uh, here is a young apostle uh, struggling to, to work out his own theology. Uh, from the very outset, uh, those epistles uh, breathe uh, a great maturity. And then there are the so-called uh, soteriological epistles concerned with the doctrines of salvation, uh, with justification by faith alone uh, particularly. And those are the epistles of the Galatians to the Romans and the two to the church at Corinth. Uh, these are all concerned with the central tenets uh, of the gospel. Uh, Romans is a systematic exposition uh, of New Testament theology, uh, starting with the doctrine of sin uh, and going through justification to sanctification uh, and then on to God's great purpose in history and concluding with four great chapters of uh, ethical directions. The one to Galatians is the sharpest of all Paul's epistles. It is also, in my view, the earliest epistle uh, written uh, uh, around uh, 49 uh, AD. Uh, I take that view because the, the central problem it deals with uh, that of the position of Gentiles in the church uh, was dealt with in the council called uh, in Acts 15, or recorded for us in Acts 15. And had that council met when Paul wrote to the Galatians, he would uh, undoubtedly have appealed to that council in support uh, of his own position. And uh, we date it early because uh, Paul does not do so, and we assume that for that it was written before that council, and therefore is dated uh, sometime perhaps between 44 and 49 uh, AD. Uh, and then there are the so-called prison epistles, written from Paul's first imprisonment 
uh, the epistles uh, to Ephesus, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Those are the prison epistles, and as I said, Philippians is one of those. And then there are the so-called pastoral epistles uh, to Timothy and Titus. Uh, they are called pastoral because they deal very much uh, with questions uh, of uh, church order. And uh, they consist of instructions to those uh, younger evangelists as to how uh, to organize the churches to deal with emerging pastoral problems. Now some of you will know that uh, there is uh, prevalent uh, in modern scholarship uh, a widespread belief that Paul uh, did not write those epistles to Timothy and Titus, that they are in fact very much later. Uh, I don't hold that view because apart from all else uh, they claim to be written by Paul uh, and that for me settles the issue. Uh, the arguments from style and so on can be easily answered in my judgment. But it's also important that the Pauline epistles, uh, as we know them today, uh, including those to Timothy and Titus, uh, were taken as a complete unit, a complete canonical unit, uh, from the very earliest stage uh, in sub-apostolic history. And... Uh, there are two great uh, blocks of undisputed books in the canon. Uh, that is, they were never disputed by the early church. Uh, the fourfold gospels are the corpus of the Pauline epistles. So there then are those uh, epistles uh, classified in terms of current uh, academic convention. I would want to say that it is quite remarkable uh, that someone who lived so active a life as Paul did and who was a constant itinerant and when he wasn't travelling was in prison uh, should have been so productive and granted that uh, of course uh, he wrote by inspiration uh, the level of human creativity the sheer intellectual force the energy behind those epistles really gives the ground uh, for astonishment. Here was one of the most practical men who ever lived, who was also the world's greatest ever thinker, uh, apart from the Lord uh, Jesus Christ himself. A great organizer, and yet also a great divine, uh, a great evangelist, and yet also uh, a theologian in a class uh, entirely by himself. And it is important to bear in mind that the fact of inspiration uh, did not take the pain and the labor out of uh, the composition. Now we know that sometimes Paul uh, used a secretary, uh, often Silvanus. Uh, in this epistle he refers to uh, Timothy and his involvement in, 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 with him uh, in, these, in this particular epistle. But uh, there is no evidence that Timothy uh, uh, wrote it, even as a secretary. Uh, it is, uh, so far as we know, entirely uh, Paul's own composition uh, and also to Paul's own writing. Now, you also recall uh, that uh, this church at Philippi was itself uh, founded by the apostle in uh, very strange circumstances. He, he was called over to Macedonia. And he went to the riverside where the Jewish, uh, the, the women were praying, uh, Jewish proselytes, and the conversion of Lydia uh, became, was the seed, the, the launching pad uh, for the virgins of this church at Philippi. Uh, you recall that while at Philippi, Paul was also imprisoned, uh, and uh, as a result of it, uh, the jailer was converted. It's clear that there was a very special bond uh, between Paul and the believers at Philippi, uh, there is little by way of correction or criticism in this epistle, and it breathes uh, a constant spirit uh, of very tactful thankfulness uh, for favors shown to him in the course of his missionary work and also in the course of his imprisonment. 
this epistle uh, is uh, deemed to have been written uh, from uh, Rome uh, during Paul's first imprisonment there. He was arrested, as you recall, at Jerusalem, taken to Rome, and the book of Acts concludes uh, with the story of Paul's arrival at Rome. And it was while he was there that he wrote this epistle uh, to the Philippians. There are some scholars who actually, I was written from Ephesus, uh, others from Caesarea, uh, but the consensus is that Paul wrote it uh, from prison in Philippi. Uh, it is uh, dated uh, around uh, 61 uh, AD. Uh, that is uh, uh, before Paul wrote to the Romans uh, or to the Corinthians uh, and the other epistles of the epistle. Uh, this is probably the first of them. Ephesians, Colossians also belong to this group. Now, so much for the crowd. I don't have time uh, in five uh, lectures uh, to through the, the Holy Epistle in any kind of detail. I'm going to look at selected portions of it. And I want tonight to look at the section uh, in chapter 1 and from verse 12 uh, down to verse 26. It has the effective beginning of the epistle. Now, it is interesting that what happens here is that the apostle takes uh, a customary literary form, an epistle. It was a very common uh, composition, a very common way right, of communicating. And Paul uses that form for Christian communication. In other words, these men did not feel that you are to invent new and special forms to uh, communicate the gospel. But you took an, ex an existing form, an epistolary form, and you, in effect, uh, baptize that into Christ. Now, there is, I think, a lesson there for all of us. Uh, for example, we could today uh, use uh, a newspaper article uh, for something of that same purpose or in the whole newspaper, rather than feel bound to invent our own specialized forms of communication, say, oh, the gospel needs uh, a special form of communication, uh, we take the existing forum. Uh, that's what Paul did. Not only so, but he abode by the conventions of that form. He didn't invent a new kind of letter writing, at least not in structure, but it takes the customary form of a letter and he baptizes it in Christ. The, the whole uh, build up of this epistle is as one would find in any letter of the period. Uh, first of all he says Paul and Timothy uh, these are the writers uh, and then to the saints uh, and then thirdly greetings. Now that's what uh, any ancient pagan would read. Paul and Timothy to so-and-so greetings. And uh, this is followed uh, by a thanksgiving, which we have uh, from verse 3 uh, down to uh, verse 11. Now, of course, the Christian dimension comes in, in that the apostle expands each of these elements with significant Christian content. And this happens almost immediately. A pagan would say, Paul and Timothy. But Paul says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. And in those few words, there is in fact a massive theology. The slaves of Christ Jesus. And then the address to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. I'm intrigued by this NIV rendering that uh, won't use the word bishop, but then that's not my problem. Uh, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, uh, together with the, with the bishops and deacons. Now again, the expansion of the address in terms of Christian content. He doesn't say uh, simply to, uh, to an assembly at Philippi, but it's to saints in Christ Jesus. And then the greetings. He doesn't say greetings. He says, grace and peace to you from God our Father 
the Lord Jesus Christ again casual and incidental and yet it is also quite massive in its theology uh, because we have the correlation of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ where does grace come from? Oh, well, you say it comes from God that's what the Old Testament said yes said Paul but it's not simply from God but God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ one of those great incidental proofs of the deity of Jesus that he equally with God the Father is the source of grace and uh, then we find the thanksgiving and here uh, in a very special way uh, the Christian content transforms uh, the customary greeting rather than say thanks for your letter thanks for your gift uh, we have this uh, great expansion of the thanksgiving uh, from verses 3 down to verse 11 now I'm not going to go to that because we don't have time tonight I want to look at the section from verse 12 as I said uh, down to verse 26 and I'm going to assume that uh, you know the content and I'm not going to read it through now I want you to know brothers that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel this is the first thing Paul wants to say to them I want you to know that what's happened to me uh, has served uh, to advance the gospel or has served the progress of the gospel I want you to know and you know possibly they wanted the apostle to tell them the facts of about his imprisonment what are conditions like in prison in Rome but Paul doesn't tell them the facts Paul tells them the effects we know a little of what it was like we know that very likely uh, in prison at Rome Paul was uh, chained day and night to a Roman soldier we know the conditions were hard uh, that those soldiers were not given to much humanity and there was of course no privacy and we know too of course that uh, this was uh, a great inhibitor as far as uh, preaching the gospel went because Paul uh, could no longer itinerate and travel uh, but yet he says now I want you to know brothers that what's happened to me uh, has really served to progress the gospel uh, the, the word that we have here really uh, covers the authorized versions word rather uh, you would expect he said that it was very detrimental to the gospel but on the contrary instead it has served to further the gospel and you know I think we should remember just how remarkable that statement is because you would have said that the gospel really uh, did depend so much on this man the Apostle Paul and you would have said well surely because this man is so central to God's purpose uh, God would give him a long life and he would give him great gifts and he would give him great freedom and yet here is the most important of God's servants in the whole world and where does he end up? he ends up in prison he ends up in effect silenced his ministry terminated and for all Paul knew it was over and done with forever he didn't know if he ever, never ever emerge uh, from this prison alive and it is a remarkable providence that God sometimes allows men on whom his cause appears so to depend to experience such frustration and to be so limited and so curtailed and I mean, you would have thought that God would ensure that Paul would have full scope for his ministry instead there he is confined in prison chained to a Roman soldier he has been told commissioned by God to go to the Gentiles he's been told to go and with the gospel to all the nations and to every creature instead he is in a prison cell and what intrigues me is that history is littered with instances of the same kind how mysterious the ways in which God works and how often it seems to us that really the gospel has suffered such a setback 
You go back, for example, to uh, Paul's uh, visit to Philippi, uh, recorded for us in Acts chapter 16. He preaches the gospel, and uh, he evangelizes, and we remember how uh, that uh, slave girl ventriloquist, as she's often called today, how she was converted, and the uproar that caused, because uh, she was, of course, uh, a great earner uh, for her owner and her master, and Paul ends up in prison. And, you know, we would say today, Paul, why did you speak to that girl? Why didn't you just ignore her? Because here we came to evangelize this city, see all the need around you. And here we are in prison, in the innermost dungeon, right in the depth of the prison. And they'd be asking, we'd be asking today, should we have come to this city at all? Was our guidance right? Did we misunderstand God's will? God never meant us to be here. You imagine missionaries go to any given part of the world today and they are no sooner there than they're imprisoned. And you say to yourself, surely they shouldn't have gone in the first place. What a setback for the gospel. But then we know how the great earthquake came and we know how the jailer was converted. And you might say to yourself, well, you know, for that one man, God moved heaven and earth. God caused this earthquake. And around these three people, so, so very, very unlike, the slave girl, Lydia, and the jailer, God built this great church at Philippi. And despite Paul and Silas ending up in the depths of the prison, things fell out for the furtherance of the gospel. You think again of the death of Stephen the greatest of all the early preachers. What a tremendous gift, what talent, what an impact that man stood to make. And yet how soon was his ministry curtailed? It all ended in martyrdom and death. But then we know that as a result of that persecution, uh, the believers were dispersed and they went everywhere preaching the word. And we wouldn't have had uh, the seminal mission to Antioch and the first Gentile church planted there were it not for the martyrdom of Stephen that seemed to be almost a terminal point across the line of progress of the Christian gospel. And you can go right down through history and see God's remarkable providences and how they have seemed so adverse to the gospel. Is it not remarkable that, I, that a man of the, of the potential of Robert Murray McChain uh, should be cut down in his prime, even before his prime, around the age of 30? Or a man like David Brainerd, again cut down before his prime? And you, know, you will say, but, but Lord, these were the men we needed. We needed these men. Why have you taken them away? And yet we could say that through their biographies, these people have spoken to generations the gospel of the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. Why did God not spare John Calvin for a longer life? or Jonathan Edwards for a longer life, or even C.H. Spurgeon for a longer life? Why did God take home our own beloved Douglas Macmillan? Why are these men, why were they taken away? And we have to say, look, these things have fallen out for the furtherance of the gospel, Paul says. This thing that looks to be such an adversity, God has his own reasons for all of these things. In his own great scheme of things, God has his reasons. Well, he says, things fell out for the progress of the gospel. I want you to look, hang on to that idea, because in fact, part of what holds this section together is that Paul sees a threefold benefit in what's happened to him. One is the progress uh, of the gospel, one is his own progress, uh, and one is the progress of the church at Philippi. It's so to advance uh, the gospel in all of these three areas. 
Well, how did it advance the gospel? Well, he says this. As a result, it has become clearly says throughout the whole palace uh, and everywhere else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. Now, in other words, he was saying, there has been a twofold impact. First, on the unbelieving world outside, and then on the believing community itself. My imprisonment has had a twofold impact. First, he said, it's had an impact on the outside community. He says, it has become known throughout the whole guard uh, and everywhere else that I am in chains for Christ. Now, we saw that the impact uh, upon the military establishment of which the prison formed a part. In those days, there were, of course, there was no civilian police and there were no civilian prisons. There was simply an establishment which was part of the whole military setup. And the gospel had spread, Paul says, throughout that establishment. It was known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and everywhere else here that this was a, a very special prisoner. Now, the language of the versions tends to say that uh, he was in chains for Christ. But that's not what Paul actually said. Paul said he, he was in chains in Christ. And there is some great force and beauty in that. He was in chains, but he was in Christ. Being in Christ doesn't make you immune to chains. And being in chains does not destroy your fellowship and communion with the Lord Jesus. Everybody here knows, he said, that I'm in chains in Christ. They know about Christ. The word about Christ had spread as a result of Paul's imprisonment throughout the whole community. Now, Paul has said they were all converted. But he says that uh, it had become clear it had become well known that he was in chains in Christ. Now that meant that the name of Jesus and uh, the claims about Jesus, the facts about Jesus were, were known throughout the whole military establishment. And perhaps many of those uh, were later part of the nucleus of the church that Paul spoke to uh, in the epistle to the Romans. So that was part of the effect. They all knew that he was in chains in Christ. The second effect was upon the believers. And Paul puts it again very, very carefully. It's uh, fascinating to see always Paul's word choice. Because of my chains, he says, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. Now, there is a certain poignancy there, because you see what he says is this. Most of the brothers in the Lord, there were some upon whom it didn't have this effect. There were some Christians that the apostles' presence did not have any effect upon them at all. Now, uh, part of what this proves, of course, is that there was a, there was a church in Rome before Paul went there. Uh, and uh, these uh, brothers in the Lord, they had been encouraged by Paul uh, to speak the word of God more fearlessly. Up to that point, they had been hesitant and they had been uh, rather cowardly. But then they saw the example of this man prepared to suffer so much for Christ. And even in his chains, bearing witness to Jesus. And they take courage and they begin to preach uh, the word of God more courageously and more uh, fearlessly. And how interesting it is that those are the adverbs that Paul uses. It doesn't say that they preached with liberty or they spoke with profundity uh, or they spoke with eloquence, but they spoke with courage. The courage it took because, of course, they saw that they might end up in the same situation. At some levels, uh, it could have been a deterrent to them to see Paul in prison. But instead, uh, 
it was a great encouragement. And the church, you see, had suffered this great setback. Its greatest preacher was in chains. And yet in that very context, the church experiences renewal. A renewal of courage, a renewal of fearlessness. New spiritual life and vibrancy flowed through the church at Rome because of the apostle uh, being in chains. It's uh, uh, worth reminding ourselves how uh, Paul had longed to come uh, to Rome. And uh, yet here he is bringing the blessing as a prisoner. And it's through his chains that the blessing actually comes into that situation. And so he says they're preaching Christ fearlessly. But then he changes tack a bit. It is true, he says, that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. They were all preaching. And yet, they weren't all preaching from the same motives. Now, what Paul says here is, at some levels, very disturbing. And yet, it's also, I think, very, very instructive for ourselves and for our attitudes towards those who preach the gospel in ways we don't perhaps agree with. It is true, he says, that some preach Christ out of envy and, and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Now, the first thing, we will forget about those uh, that Paul commends here because he preached Christ uh, from the right motives. Let's focus on those who are wrong, those in the wrong. There are one or two important points about them. First of all, they are preaching Christ. Now that is an absolutely vital point. They are preaching the true gospel, the real gospel. They are preaching the word of God. They are preaching the truth. They are preaching Christ. Had it been otherwise, Paul would not for a moment uh, have said that he was rejoicing. Had they come with something other than the gospel, had the content and the substance of the message itself been defective, Paul would not have rejoiced. We know, for example, that when he heard of uh, the Galatian situation where they were denying uh, justification by faith alone, Paul said, if somebody comes with that gospel, let him be anathema. That is not the gospel. If they are preaching salvation by works, if they want you to become uh, Jews all over again, if they are undermining God's grace, taking away your freedom in Christ, then he said, anathema, God's curse upon them if the message is wrong. The same was true when Paul heard of uh, what was happening to the church at Colossae. Men were preaching Vain philosophy and science falsely so called and they were preaching up all kinds of rules and taboos and don't uh, eat and don't touch and so on and so forth and Paul again was so scathing. But here Paul is saying I rejoice because Christ is preached. They were preaching Christ. We know at once that these men uh, weren't very nice men. They were all wrong in their whole attitude to Paul. But their message was right. They were getting the gospel across. They were telling the great facts about Christ, the great facts of the Apostles' Creed, that he was born of the Virgin Mary, that he suffered under Pontius Pilate, that he was crucified, dead, and buried, that he had risen, that he descended, that he would come again. 
those great facts about preaching Christ, that Christ died for our sins, and that Christ rose again the third day. They were preaching justification by faith alone, that those who had broken the law and were in the wrong with God could then experience God's full and free forgiveness. They were preaching the new birth. All those fundamental and essential doctrines that we know constitute the gospel, Christ. The person of Christ, the work of Christ, justification on account of Christ, all that was there. They were preaching Christ. Had they been preaching salvation by works? No. Had they simply come with gloom and doom, preaching about hell and judgment, again, he wouldn't have rejoiced. Had they come with great discourses about the evils of the day that was in it, again, he wouldn't have rejoiced. Had they, had they come and said, go to communion, you'll be saved, or be baptized, you'll be saved. Had they, they preached that, Paul wouldn't have rejoiced. But they preached Christ. They had the right message. And it's extraordinary how, how men with the right message could be so wrong in their attitude. And how men who were so wrong in their attitude could yet be right in their message. That is remarkable. And both of these things are true. The fact that we are so soundly orthodox and know all the great doctrines, they sometimes leave us far from saintly. And conversely, the fact that we are far from saintly does not always preclude our having real insight into the gospel itself. Well, these people were far from saintly. You look at the way they were preaching, the motives from which they were preaching the gospel. Envy, he said. The word seems to mean that they were preaching to get the place that Paul had had. To get that place particularly among the Christians that Paul had had. They were doing it from rivalry. In the interests of party. In the interests of their own group and their own sect. To proselytize to their own particular following or clique within the church. That was their motive. It was... Envious it was sectarian. It's a very important point that Karl Barth made once. I serve, he says, not a party but a cause. Not a party but a cause. Not a party under this label, whatever the label may be, but the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, these people, they served a party. And they preached to win recruits to their own party. He says, the former, he says in verse 17, they preach Christ out of selfish ambition. Can you imagine? Can you really imagine? This Christ whose whole form of existence and ministry was a protest against selfish ambition was the assertion of kenosis or self-denial and self-renunciation. They were preaching Christ out of selfish ambition to advance their own status and reputation. That's what was driving them. It's an amazing thing. That it's an amazing that sometimes, you know, people can make themselves rich preaching the Christ who had no place to lay his head. How people can advance their own ambitions by preaching the Christ who made himself nothing. And is there not something in all of that that is so, so suggested to us of the sheer fertility and inventiveness of evil, the forms that evil can take. Preaching Christ out of selfish ambition. Not sincerely. 
And the, the thing that follows is the most terrible of all. Supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. The authorized version says to add affliction to my chains. Well, the word affliction uh, is there in the very middle uh, of, of the text. The word that we have for to stir up is the word for the, that we have for the resurrection. God raised Jesus. They wanted to raise affliction. To, to raise tribulation for Paul in his chains. It's not that they wanted to add to his physical hardship in prison. They weren't asking that uh, his cell be made colder or his bed harder or his chains more painful. But they wanted to add to the, the problems which the physical environment created for the apostle, mental torment and petty annoyances and inner conflict to make him feel bad. It's absolutely amazing. They were preaching Christ to make the apostle feel worse so that he would hear how their party was advancing. And as some of his converts have gone over to them, and how their ambitions were being fulfilled, and they thought, well, all of these things were really, uh, that'll make him feel bad. And the insinuation, the implication is clear that they were actually preaching with that outcome in mind, so that that's, things would be worse for Paul, that in addition to his physical discomfort and inconvenience, he would have these mental uh, conflicts and annoyances to cope with at the same time. Now, the one thing more remarkable than that is Paul's own attitude to it. You know, this is part of history. They were preaching Christ to make another human being feel worse. Nothing that ever happens in the church has ever been worse than that. It was as bad as that while the church still had apostles. People sometimes think that, oh, when the church had great leaders, there were no problems. And yet, when the church had apostles, there were people preaching Christ to make other Christians feel worse. That's what Paul is saying to us here. But what does it matter, Paul says? is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. That's all that matters. That the gospel is being communicated. Now, if Paul can say that about people whose motives in preaching were nothing short of hellish, quite positively infernal, let us be very careful in the words of judgment that we so often utter upon the way that other people preach Christ. Paul is almost saying to us, the motives on which it's done and the way in which it is done, these are of no consequence provided the message is being put across. And that is a great guiding principle. Is Christ preached? There are people who preach and they're showmen. There are people who preach and they build their own empires. There are people who preach and they enrich themselves. There are people who preach and they become very, very powerful. But Paul said, ah, yes, but look, let's wait. Is Christ being preached? Is the message being put across? He does not condone the motives. We may not condone the methods. But you know, Christ is being preached. And I'm not saying, well, if that's, if that's the case, well, you just uh, congratulate everybody. No, he says, but I'm glad. I rejoice if Christ is preached. So, uh, in whatever way it's been done and by whomsoever it's done, if Christ is being preached, the believer rejoices. That is a very, very searching test of our own spirituality, of our own discipleship. Do we take that attitude? 
you know, it's so easy to, the, that's why one of the most divisive things in the church today is evangelism because it doesn't matter how you do it, there'll be somebody who doesn't like the way you do it. Your methods are wrong, your motives are wrong. And Paul said, look, he said, is the message being, got, being put across? That's what matters, the message. Now, of course, uh, there may be forms of Christian witness that will not convey the message. I'm not saying anything goes, because that's not true. I'm saying that if the method communicates the message, then it goes. If the vehicle can deliver Christ, then it's valid. Doesn't matter how it's done. I rejoice, Paul says, because Christ is preached. If it's a silly little ditty that contains only some uh, spiritual inanities, just a series of yeah, yeah, yes, or yeah, yeah, yes, well, Paul wouldn't rejoice. But if Christ was being put across in the song, or in the tract, or in the film, or the video, or the book, or the sermonate, or the 50-second radio talk, then he would rejoice because Christ was being preached. That is a challenge. And we should all remember the words of uh, D.L. Moody, which I'm sure I've quoted here already, uh, when he said after a long harangue by one of his critics about how, how bad his methods were, D.L. Moody said to him, I prefer the way I evangelize badly to the way you don't evangelize at all. Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice. Yes, is the apostle, and I will continue to rejoice. I will keep on rejoicing. Now, it's not simply saying that he will rejoice in the preaching, but he goes on now to take a great look down into the future. I am going to keep on rejoicing. Here is this man in prison, and as he writes, he is chained to a soldier. He has none of our comforts, not food, not warmth, nor proper bedding, nor proper clothing. He has no freedom, he has no privacy, nothing. I rejoice. And I'm going to keep on rejoicing, he says. I will continue to rejoice. I'll just keep on rejoicing. And that has followed that uh, seminal statement by two other statements which are interesting. They're dominated by two great words here, or two great word groups. In verse 19, for I know he will keep rejoicing because there is something he knows. And he'll keep rejoicing because there is something he expects. I know, he says in verse 19, and in verse 20, I eagerly expect and hope. I know and I expect. I rejoice because I know. I rejoice because I expect. Well, what does he know? I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. The word deliverance is the word salvation. Turn out for my salvation, for my spiritual well-being. Now, I said before, there were three things. First, the imprisonment has served to advance the gospel. Now, Paul states the second thing. This imprisonment... Uh, is uh, what has happened to me will turn out for my salvation. He is going to be delivered, or going to be saved. Uh, in other words, there is going to be no uh, spiritual detriment uh, to, to the apostle. At one level, God will not hold a silence against him, and God will not allow his salvation to be hindered or retarded in any way. What has happened to me, he says, uh, will uh, turn out for my salvation. It's part of the whole great principle that Paul put to the epistle to the, Ro the, epistle to the Romans when he said uh, that uh, all things work together for good to those that love God. And he knew that because of their prayers and because of God's grace, this imprisonment too was subsumed under that principle. It would work out for his salvation. 
And then what of his eager expectation and hope? I will in no wise be ashamed, he says, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Now, the central thing there is this. Paul's hope that Christ will be exalted by in his body. Uh, in subordination to that, uh, the apostle is expecting and hoping that he will be faithful when the day comes when uh, his case is heard, and that he will not be ashamed when that hearing takes place. That is the detail. But the most important point is the principle that Christ will be exalted. In other words, at one level he's saying that what's happened to him will work for his salvation. On another level it will work to exalt Christ. That's my hope. I know, he says, that it will work for my salvation. And I expect it to work for the exaltation of Christ. He'll be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. And he says again, and we often quote these words, but see their context. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Living, he says, is in order to exalt Christ, and dying, is to exalt Christ. Now that's what matters. The one thing that matters about my life is that my life should exalt Christ. And the one thing about my death is that my death should also exalt Christ. That is my expectation and my hope that I will exalt Christ. But he has a dilemma, an uncertainty, whether he says, by life or by death. And he says, I don't know, he says, I'm torn between the two. And in many ways, Paul's very grammar here becomes uh, almost confused and uncertain, and it turns in different directions. He knows that Christ is going to be glorified in, in him, in, in the apostle. He's sure about that. But he doesn't know whether it's by his being released and resuming his work, or whether it's by his martyrdom. And it's a very interesting thing here. Here is an apostle, a prophet, and he has no word from the Lord on that matter not here. God at this point in the epistle has not made it plain to the apostle whether he's to live or to die. He doesn't know. And he begins to wonder in, in a sort of slightly agitated state, well, what would he choose? I says, I don't know. And you know, there's a challenge there too. Would that be a dilemma to you? What to choose, life or death? I just don't know, he says. You see, his argument is this. I really don't know which would exalt Christ the more. My resuming my ministry or my martyrdom. I just can't be clear about it. It's not a question of uh, which would... Uh, more enhance Paul's own reputation or uh, most satisfy his feelings. There's a curious detachment here. I just don't know, he says, what would exalt Christ more, my life or my death. I can't make up my mind on that. And that's his dilemma. That's why I can't choose. I am torn, he said, between the two. My desire, he says, is to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. 
It would, he says, be far better from a personal level for me to be with Christ than to be to have my liberty back and to be uh, free to go where I chose and doing what I want and to have my health and comforts back. It would be better by far for me, he said, to, 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 be, to be with Christ uh, than to be simply released back into earthly life. Now, and it seems to me we've got to come to terms with this that we are really, I'm sure, virtually all of us here tonight in a different world from Paul, as far as that's concerned. And I'm not sure we should feel guilty about it. Maybe we should. But really, this, this man does not regard release and freedom and long life and health and happiness as preferable to being with Christ. Better by far, not slightly better. Not better on the whole, but uh, better by far. It is possible, of course, that one reason why Paul has taken this point of view is that Paul did not share, did not have the comforts that we have. And it may be that part of the reason why heaven has lost its attraction for so many modern Christians is that we have economic heaven on earth. And also we don't have persecution. We aren't in prison cells. And I dare say that were we chained to a Roman soldier day and night, week in, week out, and for all we, we knew for years to come, we might then say that to be with Christ would be far better. All of us have seen Christians who would have preferred death to their condition, and we have tended to be critical of them and to say, well, uh, they just wanted an escape. I'm not so sure that that, is, that that was dreadfully wrong. In times of persecution, heaven is a blessed release. I remember my own mother saying to me, the years before she died, you, your father, she said, got away easily. He didn't have to wait long in the ante room of uh, declining health and growing weakness. He got away easy, she said, but she didn't. And for her, certainly, uh, the desire was to depart. And it's Maybe that in Paul's condition too, it's linked to his circumstances. If you look at John Calvin in many parts of his institute, so emphatic he is about this, that the believer doesn't expect blessings in this life. This is a veil of tears. This is a place where we have hardship and privation and persecution and insult, he said. That's what it's about. And that's to wean us, to make us long, wrong, long for heaven. So this was a man, you see, who probably had nothing to live for, as far as his world was concerned. And he was saying that to be with Christ is better by far. But, but, he said, but. That's when I think of it from my own point of view. But when I think of you, he said, you, my spiritual children, I don't feel the same. Uh, it is more necessary for you or more beneficial for you that I remain in the body or in the flesh. It will be better for you. There are so many principles circulating here. The overriding one is that whatever happens, Christ must be exalted. The dilemma is which exalts them the more, death or life. And then there is the difference between what, what's good for Paul and what's good for them. What's good for Paul is death. But what's good for them is that he live and resume his ministry. He, he feels that they still need him. And you know, you work again the human dynamics of that. Uh, it wasn't arrogance on Paul's part, but part of the shepherd's heart. 
You know, you can think of a mother, for example, who might say, well, heaven will be my choice, but she looks at her young children, a young family, and says, they need me. And all her maternal instincts long to be spared to look after her own children for their sake. And here is Paul, the, the exhausted, spent, persecuted Christian servant of God saying oh it would be great to get home to, home to glory and home to rest but then Paul the shepherd's heart looks at the spiritual children with his father's heart and he realizes how much they need him and so he says it would be better for you if I were spared and in a curious way, you see, the humanness of this whole thing, how he moves through the process of composition from not being sure of God's will to being sure of God's will, convinced of this, he says, I know that I will remain. As a sum of that process of thinking it through, God has given him the word he hadn't given to him before. I know that I will remain. And will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So there are three areas, as I said. There is the effect on the gospel, there is the effect on the apostle, and there is the effect on the Philippians. And in some ways this closes the whole unit. Because the word here, progress, uh, echoes the word to advance, the same word in verse 12. So... Uh, really for, sir, for the progress of the gospel and now it serves for your progress and joy in faith. And it's again very human in a way because see we, we were very concerned for progress in the faith because we are so puritanical you see. But joy in the faith. Paul wanted them to enjoy these people. And it's almost, you could, you could say from some humorous point of view that this becomes very arrogant. So that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ will overflow on account of me. A very interesting word Paul used to say, through my being with you again, through my parousia, the word used for the second coming. And Paul there is such tenderness here. He knows that they're heartbroken thinking of the privation he's suffering. And he knows the joy it would give them to see him liberated and see him back among them. And in a way, although he'd rather go to heaven to see his Savior's face, he'd rather stay on earth to see theirs, to see the sheer joy as the welcome him back to the midst so that their joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me joy in Christ Jesus such a masterly use of words joy in Christ Jesus in Christ Jesus on account of me two prepositions small prepositions and and dia uh, but to uh, distinguish carefully uh, they will joy in Christ Jesus because he has answered their prayers that Paul will release. So uh, they are rejoicing in Christ because Christ released Paul. The two are combined. And uh, there is all this marvelous interaction then. So he knows that he will, whatever happens, he will be spared and he will be restored to them so that through my being with you again your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me now I'm going to leave it there that if we want to raise uh, any questions I'll do my best to uh, answer them I'm not going to promise to be able to do so uh, but uh, certainly I'll be happy to try